My name is Aaron Atimpe. I come from Ghana. I am an international development um, practitioner and currently works with Star Ghana Foundation. And I work as a projects manager leading our work on peace, security, and stability. And I am delighted today to be joined by my wonderful colleague, um, fellow One Young World Ambassador, um, Nadaf. Um, thanks, Aaron. And thanks, One Young World, for this opportunity. My name is Nadav Weiman, and I'm a senior director at the organization Breaking the Silence. We're an organization of ex-soldiers that were a part of the IDF. And what we do, we collect testimonies from fellow soldiers uh, about what we did, about the checkpoints that we stood, about the home raids that we did, about the arrests that we were a part of, basically what is the Israeli occupation over the Palestinian territories. And we use those testimonies to explain to everyone that wants to hear what is the Israeli occupation. And our goal is to raise awareness about the military dictatorship that we have in our backyard. And we want more and more people to resist in Israel and outside of Israel. All right. Thank you so much, Nadav, for sharing your background and also for the very incredible work that you are doing in Israel. And of course, the impact that that is having in other parts of the world with regards to peace. I'm curious to know from your experiences in um, Israel and then also just very broadly, from your personal experiences, what would you think are the challenges to um, peace building and conflict transformation that has ensured that all of these efforts have not really um, yielded a sustainable peace? Yeah, so in our situation here in Israel, uh, Israel-Palestine, it's a little bit complicated and I think one of our problems in Israel-Palestine uh, that I experience a lot because we're an organization that deals a lot with uh, political education, uh, we do tours and lectures and panels and we try to educate people about what we're doing over there, is that lack of knowledge. The Israeli side that I'm a part of doesn't really know a lot about Palestinian history, about Palestinian way of living, about Palestinian culture, about the Palestinian narrative. And because of that, because we don't accept their narrative or we don't understand about the, I don't know, shared history that we in Palestinians have, it is easy to see Palestinians only as enemies or let's say an entity. They are not individual, human beings with desires, with families, with dreams. They are all an enemy without a face. And I, I served as a soldier in the special forces of uh, the IDF in a sniper's team. And me and my team were snipers and we did a lot of things in the West Bank and in West Bank and Gaza. And when I joined Breaking the Silence, they gave a testimony about what I did. My interviewer told me, hey, Nadav, so you remember a lot of faces, right? Because you were a sniper. And I said, no, because for me, everybody was an enemy because I couldn't tell a part of individual, by the way, civilians and combatants. It was, everything was a mix for me. And I think that as... Uh, we can do, we can invest a lot of efforts in trying to build peace, economic, or uh, talking, or I don't know what, but without getting to know the other side and let the other side know us, we cannot have a, a conversation even, right? We cannot have any acquaintance with one another. And I think this is one of the biggest obstacles that we have to pass over in our yeah. work here in Israel-Palestine, to get the two sides just to know one another. Right. Thank, thank you so much. You, you stress so much on the importance of getting to know the perspectives. And I mean, um, with my work here in Ghana also, what I see is that sometimes um, we achieve what can best be described as superficial peace. So because we put so much effort, sometimes we just sort of um, get tired and then declare a particular peace process as concluded because people have superficially or as a result of courtesy or respect for the people who are involved in the mediation process, um, just give in in the open. And then we all leave the table being really excited that we've achieved peace. And then two or three days or a few years time, we, we just slid back to a very terrible situation. And I see that a lot of it is so, so mainly because we don't get to the root causes. And I think that gets back to the point you made about um, understanding the perspective. So that brings to mind the concept of um, positive peace. 
it's, it's gained a lot of um, popularity, both in academia and even in practice by among politicians and diplomats and very different people. And it's essentially the, the fact that a more lasting peace that is built on sustainable investment um, in economic development and institutions, as well as societal attitudes foster um, a lasting peace or what some others will call um, human security. Um, this looks more, I mean, to some, this looks more like a mirage. It looks like an ideal situation that is not necessarily achievable. From where you sit and all of your um, experiences in this sector, do you think that positive peace is achievable in practice? Is it, is it a practical concept? Is it possible at all? And what would you think would be the practical steps? That is, if you think that this is practical in the first place, what would you think are some of the ways to help achieve um, this kind of lasting and sustainable peace? And if not, why do you think that this is not a practical concept at all? Yeah, so I will begin by saying, I, I'm not sure it's a practical concept. Mm. I, I think maybe when you're debating um, in closed rooms with counterparts, it could be a good idea. But when you come to the field, I think it's a little bit different. Uh, in, in, in our case, in Israel-Palestine, uh, in between 1993 and 1995, we had the Oslo Accords, Oslo A and B, that we and the Palestinians signed on, mediated by the Norwegian government and, of course, the, uh, the Americans. And in that in that peace accord, it was in steps actually, and and the steps towards peace were, among other things, um, taking responsibility, giving sorry, giving responsibility to, for Palestinians on their livelihood. Uh, because we control them for the past 56 years, right? So, but the main things of, um, let's say, digging new waterways or controlling the borders or deciding which represented, international representative can be open in one of the Palestinian cities or the currency, everything was left in our hands. So about positive peace, you can say, yes. So if we just bring those things to Palestinians back then, 20 years ago, or more than that, actually, maybe it was a good step for positive peace. But the mm -hmm. problem is that it was in our hands, again, I'm talking from the Israeli experience, it, yeah. was, it was left in our hands because the peace process or conversation between us, between us and Palestinians are run by the IDF, by the Israeli army, because the, our peace process with Palestinians are considered in Israeli eyes as a form of security. And when the army run things, the army looks at everything from the scope of the gun. If it's a threat or a non-threat, or I can, how can I eliminate that threat? So for, in our situation, good things like that, like positive peace, I, I don't think they can work because everybody only thinks about all of the Palestinians, they push us to the sea and they, all of them want to kill us and all of that, what I said before about Palestinian as an enemy, as an internal enemy, mm -hmm. as, as a a never-ending enemy, I don't never ending fighting, something like that. I do think that touching the core issues before we right. mentioned co core issues also right in, in Ghana. So addressing core issues, in our case, it's Jerusalem, which is <clears throat> wow. <laughs> Only about that we can have a, 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 a seminar of seven days. It's Jerusalem and also Palestinian refugees and the Israeli settlers changing the population between the two territories. And I think that if we'll get that off the table, and that didn't happen, mm -hmm. never. In all of the conversation between us and Palestinians, the hard issues, the core issues were left for the last part. And all of those peace forces collapsed eventually. So I think we have to, first of all, address the harshest things and then, and then, we can touch lighter, uh, quote-unquote, subjects. I don't know what the situation in Ghana, or, or, or what you think about positive peace. Yeah, thanks. I I, I really so much um, agree with your perspective, especially on um, addressing the other broader issues. And I just think that um, positive peace is, is not necessarily out of reach. What I would say is that it's, it's a lot more painful and slower path to walk, but it's not to say that it's not um, it's not achievable at all. It's just a lot more painful and um, and and slow. And and I say so because I, I I share some of my experiences from Ghana and also what is happening a lot in the Sahel. 
to mean that, yes, there are the um, overriding drivers of, of the conflict. So there is a particular point of disagreement between factions, but then there are there's an intersection of a whole lot of other factors that also drive people towards violence. So then it goes beyond just the primary issue that is of contention between two factions to then include other issues of livelihood, to then include other issues of um, people's disillusionment with governments and state agencies, local authorities and all of that. So um, when I look at the concept of positive peace in that other aspect of investing in all of the other intervening issues to ensure that we address those issues, then we can isolate the primary cause of the conflict, the main point of contention between the warring factions, then the, the, the process, the path towards peace becomes a lot more smoother and easier to walk. Otherwise, um, peace in itself is not just a straightforward thing. And there's always a point of contention, but it's not a binary process. Sometimes it's about taking a step forward and then sometimes three or five steps even backwards. But that can still be considered progress it, depending on how you look at it. So um, in, in my estimation, and then also, like I said, sharing from the experiences of what is happening in the Sahel and then the spillover of that to coastal countries like my country, Ghana, a lot of it has to do with economic drivers. A lot of it has to do with livelihood issues. So if I take the concept of positive peace from that perspective of investing in the other intersectional issues like livelihoods, like employment, like improving governance systems, then of course, I think it's, it's, it's achievable because it paves the way for us to be able to then isolate what the key issue of contention between the warring factions are, and then we can focus on that and it becomes very, very um, achievable. Um, I'm going to move to the next question, um, Nadav, because you mentioned a lot about um, reconciliation and a lot of your work centers on that. We, we see that reconciliation in post-conflict societies is um, an essential element for um, peace, peace building processes. So it just doesn't end um, by getting people to say that we are not going to fight any longer, but actually ensuring that people say what is on their hearts in a very truthful manner and getting to the heart of that. So before moving towards um, reconciliation, there is there has to be truth telling, like you mentioned from, from, from your introduction, because it's only true understanding the harm that was committed by one faction against the other or vice versa, that we can truly establish what needs to be reconciled. Um, so in a world that is full of propaganda, and in these days, the spread of disinformation and misinformation, what does that mean? What are the implications for um, reconciliation and then the truth telling that is very necessary for reconciliation to happen? Yes. So I've got to say that's the core of my work because we collect testimonies from soldiers, men and women that serve in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip where we have military regime and we publish those testimonies. So publish testimonies that I rely 100% in the testifiers and in the testimony that's the most important thing for us. Because if I will publish one lie, that's it for me. Because as an organization that is against the Israeli occupation, but as combat soldiers that were a part of the IDF, we pose a threat for the right-wing governments in Israel, and we pose a threat for the settler community in the West Bank that believe in Jewish supremacy and did pogroms, did terror attacks against Palestinian civilians under the protection of the Israeli army. So if we, the soldiers that served over there, we tell Israel and the world what is actually done by our name, by the name of Israel over there, we pose a huge threat for the continuance of the Israeli occupation and um, the settlement movement. So telling the truth about it, about how a lot of time Palestinians are our test subject for new technology, how, um, how a, a soldier feel while he's standing in a checkpoint, they need to see uh, civilians, women, children, adults going through the checkpoint every day, not doing anything bad, but you get a command that you have to check them, that you have to be aggressive towards them, all of that, or storming a house in the middle of the night just to make that family afraid because their cousin is a, is a gunman or because their father is suspected terrorist or things like that, things that I was sent to do. If you tell the truth about them, People would say, hey, 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 people in Israel would say, whoa, 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 what we are doing over there? So telling the truth 
as the first step before everything of ending a conflict, of coming to peace, it's a crucial step. Because now Israelis, when they open the newspaper, they will hear about the occupation that is 25 minutes away from their home, only when a settler will get stabbed or a soldier will get stabbed. The day to day of it, they won't hear it. That's why my voice, the truth that I'm giving to my society, the international community, is super important. And it's the first step. Because while I'm breaking my silence and telling what I was sent to do by the State of Israel as a member of the Special Forces, that's the first step. The second step is to break the silence of our society, right? Saying, yeah, we don't want to think about what is happening over there in the West Bank. Oh, I'm, point, I'm pointing West. I'm po- East. I'm pointing to the West Bank. <laughs> I'm in Tel Aviv, but I'm pointing yeah. to the West Bank. It's like, okay. So the second silence I have to break is our society, our politician. And without telling the truth, everything that would remain in the air is all of the slogans that we hear from the far right wing in Israel or from the sympathizers of the settler movement or I don't know what. So truth is the first step towards peace. Thanks. Thank you so much for sharing those perspectives. And I, I think that um, what I get from your um, your answer is that some, the truth is always there. The truth can be one, but then there are different groups of people with their own versions of the truth. The responsibility is now on those of us who are peace builders and then also authorities and third parties who are interested in seeing conflict resolved to be ahead and lead a narrative to ensure that the single truth, the truth that would lead to um, reconciliation is the one that leads the conversation and not the varying perspectives that people have about what is their own truth, which sometimes is just um, deliberately um, tweak to mislead the public and then to gain sympathy from a certain group or something. So there's the need for us in, in this context where it's very easy for someone to sit in their room and create their own truth, which could be misleading and then get it spread across board to be ahead of the conversation and ensure that we step up efforts on um, fact-checking. And a lot of the conflicts are localized. So fact-checking has to go beyond just getting tech companies to issue disclaimers to also then stepping down to, um, how do you call it, to using local languages and local mm-hmm. means to sort of um, help uh, put the truth out there. Um, I would jump to, it's, it's a very interesting conversation and I would have loved to have your perspectives on the uh, potentials of AI for preventing and countering violent extremism, but then also resolving conflicts. But we're running out on time, so I'm going to give you an opportunity to combine that very briefly. And then also because you have a lot of experiences in this area and seeing that there are um, a lot of young people who are playing critical roles in promoting social cohesion and preventing conflict, they would want, I'm sure they would want to hear from your experiences, what your advice and admonishment would be for young people who have an interest in contributing to peace and development. So just your perspectives on what the potentials of AI for peace is and then your advice to young peace builders. Okay, thanks, Aaron. Um, so first of all, about AI, I'm sorry to say, on our side, AI is on the side of the conflict, not the side of cro- conflict resolution. And what do I mean? In the last couple of years, the IDF in the West Bank and Gaza is using more and more technologies to control Palestinians. Things that we see in Russia, things that we see in China, using, for example, uh, cameras that can that have ability of facial recognition, are being mounted now on checkpoints in the West Bank, also being handed to uh, soldiers with uh, cell phones, uh, IDF cell phones that have only one app, facial recognition, and they get a command to stop Palestinians on the street, take a photo of their face, and then immediately they get from the database in the IDF all of the information about that Palestinian, permits or not permits, if he's wanted for interrogation or not. And you can say to yourself, okay, maybe it sounds logic, but Two things. First of all, nobody asks the Palestinian what they think if they want to be photographed like that. And second of all, that algorithm, the AI algorithm, gets it wrong. Okay, because who writes the code? White men sitting in an office over here in Tel Aviv, right? And we know from international research about uh, those kind of AI algorithms, they get it wrong when it's not the faces that they put inside the system for checking, different kind of faces. And those cameras are also mounted on 
a couple of pilots that, that we saw in the West Bank, very strong cameras that can look inside Palestinian homes through windows, through uh, doors, and identify faces of people while they're giving, um, I don't know, their children a bath in the middle uh, during the night, invading their privacy, using those technologies to control Palestinians. And even more than that, we have, I, I can talk about technologies for hours, right? So we are using, as the strong side of the conflict, technologies to in, entrench our control on the Palestinian population. So in my case, I've got to say that I'm a little bit against it, really against it, actually. Yeah. Um, and, and for your other question, I, have, I think I have one mes message to young leaders all around the world. If you believe in something and you really feel you're doing something right, pursue that dream, right? I was a student when I joined Breaking the Silence. I was uh, about to be a teacher in high schools in Israel. Then I understood that I, I'm really good at explaining what I did in my army service and raising awareness about it and bringing more people with me. And from an activist in this organization, I'm a part of the management in the organization and I'm doing very important things against the Israeli occupation because I believed in myself. I said, okay, I'm doing the right thing. I know Israel should be a democracy and should end the military dictatorship in the West Bank and Gaza. And that's why I'm doing this for the past 12 years. And that's why I think we're going to win because the Israeli occupation is not going to be here forever. Okay? And that's, and that's what drives me every day for the past 12 years. So my advice, follow your dream. Thank, thank you very, very much, Nadab, for that inspiring advice. And um, what I get and what I can give also just from that is that um, peace building is, is a very, very big puzzle. But every bit of work that you do as a young peace builder, as a young person, contributes to getting the world closer to understanding and solving that puzzle. So don't get overwhelmed by the enormity of the challenges you see around. Once you contribute your bit and another person elsewhere contributes their bit, bit by bit, we are all going to be able to understand the puzzle and then be able to solve it and then move a step towards um, achieving sustainable peace. So keep being yourself, keep your contributions, keep motivated and don't get underwhelmed, don't get overwhelmed by the enormity of the challenge and continue doing what you do to contribute to sustainable peace in the world. And by that, I am so much happy to conclude the session and thanks so much um, Nada for joining us today and sharing very insightful thoughts. Um, I mean, with your input and through this discussion, the digital event, I'm very much sure has advanced empowerment and action. Um, we've touched on the importance of bridging um, peace building and conflict resolution. And it's our hope that this session has helped broaden the One Young World Delegate's understanding of the key factors of peace building and conflict transformation. Um, such as the importance of tackling disinformation, the importance of truth telling, and the potentials of artificial um, intelligence in countering and preventing violent extremism, and the overall challenges and possibilities of peace building work. Thank you so much, Nadav, and thank you so much to everyone watching and joining us on this digital session for paving the way. We are very happy to have you as part of the One Young World community. Thank you so much. My name is Aaron Atzimberg.